as I did my quick math, 84, graduated, you were 18. So you were 16. Does it have anything to do with the fact that you were 16 and, you know, like this was, you probably just got your license and you were driving to whatever, what's your, what was your movie theater of choice in Brooklyn? Well, I had a couple of movie theaters that all sucked. There was the <laughs> King's Plaza, which had been a, a twin, which they turned into a quadplex. So if you didn't like the movie you were watching, you could always listen to the movie that oh, yeah. was in the theater next to you. Just, you know, so that was a terrible theater. And then I had near me that I had the Georgetown twin and they showed like the Paramount and Col even as a kid, I knew like it was reviewed. This is how ridiculous I was. I knew like, oh, the Paramount and Columbia movies would be at the Lowe's and the Warner Brothers movies would be at the King's Plaza. I mean, I was in high school. I was reading Variety. I mean, it was pretty sick. I was using my babysitting money to buy weekly Variety at the train station every every day, you know, every week. So but um, but. Yeah, I, I, you know, it's easy to say it's nostalgia. And with certain films, I think it is. You know, there's certain films which qualitatively maybe aren't as great that maybe it is a little bit nostalgia. I just saw them at the time and they connected to me in a way. But I think what you really see with 82 is it's the last gasp of the 70s. And it's before sort of Star Wars, you know, took over. And it was about experiences and less about story and about character. 82, they knew Star Wars was a huge success. Because remember, these were movies that were being developed after Star Wars from 70. So like in, in 78, 79, you know, maybe the scripts were being written. Maybe they were being shot in 80, 81. They come out in 82. So you really have the 70s sensibility. And they're unleashing like these auteurs on bizarre things. Like Paul Schrader, who did Taxi Driver, is doing a remake of Cat People. Right. That's crazy. And then you have you know, somebody like John Carpenter who, you know, grew up on the thing and he says, oh, OK, now I'm an adult. I'm going to do the thing. Right. It's all these people who grew up on Marvel Comics now who are making Marvel Comics movies. So instead, they grew up on these movies in the 50s, but they're putting their, their unique spin on it. I mean, what's crazy is could you imagine now a movie like John Carpenter's The Thing coming out in the middle of summer in which, spoiler alert, it doesn't really have an ending. It does, but it's super dark and fatalistic. I mean, it's basically nihilistic. And it, it's it's so, this is not a summer movie. And yet it came out in the middle of June, the same day as Blade Runner. And then what was the big success that weekend? Well, that weekend, it was not a success, but making more money in Blade Runner and the thing was Megaforce, a movie people don't even remember anymore with flying motorcycles and Barry Boswick, which is basically was financed by a toy company that you could see being made today. But that didn't make, you know, it didn't make any money, although I think it's one of the funniest things in the segments in the whole documentary because Barry Boswick is so self-deprecating, you know, about the whole thing. And the, the movie clips alone are just like, you know, most people haven't seen it. And they're like, what the hell is this thing? I think we're going to sell more Blu-rays for them of that movie. Because everybody's going to say, I got to see this Megaforce. It's just nuts. It's it's gonzo. So, but like, I, I think that if I saw E.T. tomorrow, if it just came out tomorrow, I would still love it the way, you know, maybe I loved it in 82. I mean, Star Trek 2, there's a reason it's still the... um the high point of the Trek films. It's still the Zenith. It's the Ape. It's the one that everybody looks at. We want our Star Trek two. Every time they developed a new Star Trek movie, it was like, how can we have our con? How can we have our Star Trek two? This is 40 years ago. They still haven't come close to nailing that formula again. And um, so I think it's not just nostalgia. I mean, same thing with something like the road warrior, um, even something like a dopey fantasy, like, Oh, you see Arnold Schwarzenegger. You think it's gonna be like, Oh, he's playing Conan. It's gonna be like Hercules in New York. It's gonna be, you know, this guy was in bumping eye and he's playing Conan. Right. But there's so much substance to it. Now, admittedly, it's this right wing Nietzschean nonsense, <laughs> but it's still great. There's something substantial about it. It's not like, you know, just goofy, like it would be today. I mean, you know, and, and, and it's really, it's dark and it's gritty and it's, it's, it's really cool. I mean, this is the era of Excalibur, which had come out the year before, you know, where your fantasy wasn't like Harry Potter. It was like, there's stuff going on and there's, it's saying something and it's, it's, it's taking all kinds of risks. I mean, Jim Henson does a movie, you know, it's not the Muppets. It's, it's a bunch of puppets. It's a bunch of Muppets, but he's doing Tolkien the whole movie with puppets. <laughs> I mean, it's crazy. Who would do this kind of stuff now? That's why 82, it's it's the audacity of it. And it's interesting because Scott Mance, who's one of the other producers and a very well-known film critic who, uh, who's, who, who I love, um, he says in the documentary, 
you know, he talks about a lot of people say the greatest year of all time for movies is 39. You know, but he thinks he says 82 isn't just the greatest geek year ever. It's the greatest year for movies. I don't agree with that. I think 39 is definitely better. I, I, you know, I put Mr. Smith comes to goes to Mr. Smith comes to Washington and Wizard of Oz and, you know, some of the movies, I think 42. And, you know, I think there are a couple of better years. I, th- I you know, so I would argue that point with him. But 82 in terms of the risk taking and in terms of the diversity of the types of films that were being made, it's hard to touch because the, you know, the hits for the most part were really great. Like Officer and Gentleman is a, just, it's a really terrific romance. I mean, Rocky three, I think is a terrific, you know, Rocky movie. And I think someone, I think it was David Goodman who says in the documentary series, he goes, it's like the original superhero movie because it's like, Mr. T is like a supervillain and Rocky is like, you're not dealing with like, the realism of Rocky and Rocky two anymore. It's a superhero movie. And then it's like, he has to team up with his old nemesis, you know, uh, Apollo Creed to fight the supervillain. And he's right. Because if you watch those fight scenes, it's more like a superhero movie than a boxing match. I mean, just hearing the, you know, the, the, the way they, the post-production sound on that, it's, it's, it's nuts. And, um, I mean, just in every genre, you see all this envelope pushing. I mean, science fiction, you look at Blade Runner, obviously, people are still talking about it today. It's remarkable. It's influenced more movies. For a movie that was not successful, it has had more impact on the genre than any film I can think of in terms of its impact, maybe other than Alien. And they were both directed by Ridley Scott. Ridley Scott? So yeah. then E.T., you know, is probably the greatest family four quadrant movie since Wizard of Oz. Star Trek II, we talked about, is the greatest Star Trek movie of all time. Road Warrior, well, now Fury Road gives it a run for its money. And then Tron, which is not a great movie, is, again, so audacious. Disney is not the Disney we know and love now. Disney was in the toilet. Disney was putting out movies like Condor Man. Disney couldn't get arrested. All they had to was re-release their old animated films. So what do they do? They, they put all the, they bet the house on a movie in which a guy is shrunk down into uh, his computer and his fighting and his Spartacus inside your computer. And nobody had computers at the time. So it's even more, I'll use a Yiddish word from Brooklyn, fakakta. It's just more, even more fakakta. So um, that's crazy. You know, so that's science fiction. You know, fantasy, we talked about Conan and Dark Crystal, but then you have the Beastmaster, which was ubiquitous at the time. You know, you grew up then. It was like HBO was, hey, Beastmaster's on. That's what it stood for. It wasn't the Sopranos. It wasn't, you know, Succession. It was the Beastmaster. They, they had a little a lower bar back then. And then uh, and then it, it goes to TBS and they start calling it the, the Beastmaster station because next to Wizard of Oz, it was the most successful ratings they had on anything. And it was always on. So it was just crazy. And what's even more insane is like Conan the Barbarian costs like $40, $50 million. It's huge. They shoot in Spain. It's big and ambitious. And, you know, and and then this little movie that they pick up for a million dollars, The Sword and the Sorcerer, comes out from some nobody distributor. It makes more money than Conan. That's what people don't even remember these things. It's like Sword and the Sorcerer. This, I, I will say crappy, but I mean it with love. This crappy little Sword and a Sorcerer with Lee Horsley, who starred in Matt Houston that year, but um, comes out and it makes more money than Conan. Because that's when you could have these little drive in nothing movies that would make more money than the studio films because home video was only in its infancy, you know, and it was the big year for home video. I mean, we, we don't even get into that in the documentary because it was so damn long. It's um they start putting out uh, uh, videotapes for thirty nine ninety five for sell through. It's the first time everything was rental until then. So what Star Trek two and Officer and Gentleman Paramount puts out for thirty nine. Now you can buy movies and build the library. It was the beginning of you know the whole home video industry. I mean, so a eighty two is like the apex of so many things. And I'm gonna keep going until you cut me off. <laughs> and so it teen exploitation. So I mean, I love the quote Entertainment Weekly a couple of years ago said, "Fast Times at Ridgemont High." Is the um, is is the Citizen Kane of teen exploitation, and that's not wrong. Could you imagine a movie now dealing honestly with the issue of abortion? You can't even get an abortion in half the states anymore. This was a movie in Universal that was like they were talking about these things in a meaningful, you know, way. And so yes, that you know, there's the famous Phoebe Cates scene with Judge Reinhold, but there's so much 
depth and substance it's cameron crowe i mean he he lived this thing and then amy heckerling just does an amazing job directing it but it's funny but you have something like fast times and it gets lumped in with the teen exploitation of the era which is like porkies which is just terrible i know people still defend it i'm not one of them i didn't like it then i don't like it now but it was huge porkies you know zapped guys who use their telekinetic powers, Scott Baio, it figures, who uses telekinetic powers to, to basically uh, take clothes off of women. And, uh, and, and you know, and all this stuff. So it's like you have all this crazy teen exploitation, which then became the fodder for, for home video. And, and comedies are brilliant. So, I mean, you say I'm the sci-fi guy, but I mean, like I, if I was on a desert island and I had a choice between some of the sci-fi and the com- I'd probably take the comedies because you had Tootsie, which is amazing. You have 48 Hours, which, you know, marks the emergence of Eddie Murphy as an incredible movie star um, who's brilliant in it. And the funny thing, and most people don't know, that movie almost got shut down because they thought Eddie Murphy wasn't going to work, that the, the dailies were terrible, they, you know. And then, you know, I was really glad because one of the joys of doing the TV series was to be able to shine a light on the more, like I said, esoteric. So something like Diner, which people don't talk about anymore. To me, that's the ultimate geek movie. I mean, it has the football test in it and it has the whole, you know, the whole scene with the record collection where Daniel Stern is furious at Ellen Barkin for the way she's organizing and misorganizing his records. And, you know, that they're not in the right place. And how dare she, you know, not put the Dizzy Gillespie, you know, next to, the, you know, why is jazz and rock and roll? And I mean, to me, that that is that is a geek movie, regardless of the fact that it's not a geek movie. And Barry Levinson was one of those guys at the time who could do no wrong. He was like, there are a couple of these directors who could do no wrong, like Rob Reiner, until they started doing wrong. You know, until until they lost it. Somehow they just lost it. But for a while, they were like doing the greatest stuff in the world. And my favorite year, which is another movie that's brilliant. That's musing on sort of an elegy for a bygone era, you know, and Peter O'Toole basically playing Errol Flynn. I mean, it's and I could go on and on. I'm not going to go on and on, but that's like it's an amazing year. And that only scratches the surface. All right. We're out of time. Thank you very much. (laughs) Sorry.